Wow, and everyone said amen, right? <clears throat> Thank you so much, choir, orchestra, leading us in worship. Thank you, Ricky, also, for that message on giving today. Well, you know that our theme for 2023 is why does it matter? And we're exploring various facets, facets of that question throughout 2023. And we find ourselves here in the summer of this year. And so we are having a conversation about eternity for this summer. Why does it matter? You'll remember that um, we have asked you, if you haven't gotten one of these yet, we want you to get one of these, uh, John 3, 16, little placard, and we want you to take that with you around this summer and uh, have some photos made with it. You saw Kurt Grice's photo in the video a moment ago, and uh, we'd love for you to take those, and you can upload those photos to fpca.org slash John316. And also, you'll notice on that landing page, there's some information for you about um, how to engage people in a conversation when you're having these photos made. So we're looking forward to a fun summer and seeing where all you go and, and how the Lord may use you to share the gospel this summer. Um, also, you know that we have more conversation about what we're talking about on Sunday mornings because the conversation about eternity is a very complex conversation. And so um, every week we have a podcast called Tell Me More. And uh, Katie and Luke and I have a conversation about the sermon and just try to explore things a little more deeply. So wherever you find your podcast, you can go to Tell Me More and you can listen to what we have to say a little bit more fully explaining what we've talked about here on Sunday morning. So last Sunday, we began this conversation on eternity. And you remember, we learned some new vocabulary, okay? Um, because we need to get the vocabulary down so we can have this conversation. So for example, we learned the word phonesia. You remember it? <clears throat> you remember phonesia? Remember forgetting who you're calling when you dial the phone, when they answer the phone? That's phonesia. Uh, Adorkable, remember that one? People who are so awkward, they're actually cute and uh, admirable. Cakeism, remember that word? Can't have your cake and eat it too. These are real words that have been added to the dictionary, y'all. Um, our children that are going to be here, we did this every session in children's camp, so some of them will remember. Another one we used in children's camp was disconfect. Y'all know what disconfect is? It is the attempt to sterilize a piece of candy that's been dropped on the ground by blowing on it. <clears throat> that is disconfect. We saw that many times at children's camp. <clears throat> one other one we learned at children's camp was paternity leave. Paternity leave. That is a brief leave of absence for employees who are adding a new pet to their household. So, um, paternity leave. Actually, the real vocabulary we learned last week had to do with our conversation about eternity. So we talked about imminent frame, transcendence. We use those phrases from Charles Taylor's book, The Secular Age. The idea that many Americans have lost any sense of eternity, any, any connection to an eternal perspective, any belief in transcendence. We talked about late modernism, our current era where the self has been enthroned and the autonomy of the individual person and personal freedom are now the core values in our society. And then any conversation about eternity, we have to at least uh, give a shout out to what I would call inaugurated eschatology. We didn't use that phrase last week, but we've used it numerous times at our church. That means that we know we live in this present age, but we know that the age to come has already been established by Jesus. And so the age to come and the present age now overlap. You and I still live in this present evil age, but we've already begun living in the age to come because we're the new covenant people of God. So for us, eternity has already started. So when we reflect upon eternity, we're going to have to deal with a couple of topics that are unavoidable, heaven and hell. Next Sunday morning, I'm going to share a message on heaven. So today, I want to share a message with you on hell is there ever a good time to talk about hell? As I planned and prayed and looked at our calendar, I realized this is Camp Sunday and our youth and our children are coming back from camp. But here's what I want you to know about the camp experience. The um, leaders of our ministries tied in the lessons at camp with what we're doing here 
at our church on Sunday mornings. And so for the children, our theme was grace, a journey to grace. But we learned about the grace of God and how the grace of God is the reason why we can have eternal life in heaven. The youth, we took them on a little more serious tack, if you will, because they're more mature. And we talked about eternity and had conversations about both heaven and hell. Here's what I would say about hell before I share this message with you. I don't remember if some, one of my seminary professors said this to me, or I just heard it along the way, or if I made it up myself. I can't remember. But somewhere along the way, I heard this, that anybody that preaches or teaches on hell needs to do it with a broken heart. And if you can't do it with a broken heart, you should leave it alone. So I want you all to know that my heart is broken about hell. What I want to share with you this morning, though, is what I believe to be a biblically sound and theologically accurate reflection on the topic of hell. And I want to share it with you today. So I want you to look in your Bibles with me at the book of Revelation. Okay, there are, there are numerous passages we could have turned to this morning to have a conversation about hell. But in Revelation 20, John shares with us a scene from the future. The Lord has given him a glimpse, if you will, of what is to come. We don't always get the chronology of Revelation correct. And the reason for that is John doesn't share everything necessarily chronologically. John is an artist as he paints a theological picture for us. Um, he's not Luke. Luke is a left brain historian. Praise God for Luke. John is a right brain theological artist. I'm, I'm more comfortable with Luke. There's a reason Luke did not write Revelation. So John will just say, and then I saw. And then I saw. So he's painting something for us. But we do have a sense of chronology when you come to Revelation 20. This is after the return of Jesus, and we are now at the end, and the final judgment commences. So we pick up the story, Revelation 20. Let's begin in verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So, let's begin this conversation this morning. You know, according to the latest research that's been published by the Pew Forum, when American adults were asked the question, do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in hell? 72% of American adults say they believe in heaven. 62% say they believe in hell. So it's interesting to me that remarkably, in this day and age, the majority of American adults still believe in a literal hell. Now, I know that adults make light of hell. I, I get it. <clears throat> Mark Twain said, go to heaven for the climate, go to hell for the company. <clears throat> he also said, I don't like to commit myself about heaven or hell. I have friends in both places. <clears throat> Isaac Asimov wrote, I don't believe in an afterlife, so I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. For whatever the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would be even worse. My favorite cartoonist, Gary Larson. Y'all remember Gary Larson? The far side, all-time favorite cartoon, right next to Peanuts. Peanuts is, of course, the champion. It's Peanuts and everybody else. But then after that, Gary Larson. Gary Larson used to 
like to poke fun about hell with his cartoons. Can I show you one of, just one of them? Here's one where you see the devil saying, pizza's been delivered to hell. And he says, first of all, this is going straight back and I'll just have a little chat with whoever placed the order. And on the box it says, we deliver anywhere. <laughs> Again, I, I get it. We, we poke fun about it. It's challenging. You know, philosophers and theologians alike throughout history have struggled with the whole idea of hell. One of the most famous modern philosophers, Bertrand Russell, he famously said this about hell. He says, there's one very serious defect to my mind in Christ's moral character, and that is he believed in hell. I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. I cannot myself feel that either in matter of wisdom or in matter of virtue, Christ stands quite as high as some other people known to history. I think I should put Buddha and Socrates above him in those respects. So Bertrand Russell says that because of Jesus' teaching about hell, he had a flawed moral character. Peter Kreef's a theologian, Boston College, who believes in hell. But he says this, of all the doctrines of Christianity, hell is the most difficult to defend, the most burdensome to bear, and the first to be abandoned. Today, there are many theologians, philosophers, who struggle. Some no longer believe in hell. Probably the most famous theologian who's writing about that position, I would say, is David Bentley Hart. Uh, David Bentley Hart has written this book, That All Shall Be Saved. And it is basically a treatise on universalism that everybody ultimately will be redeemed. It's interesting. I bought this book because I knew that it was an argument basically against what I believe. And sometimes I think it's really good to read things that you know are not necessarily in agreement with you. That way you don't just live your whole life in an echo chamber. And so it's, it's a thoughtful book. I found it quite interesting because he presents an argument. It's a series of lectures, devotionals that he gave that ultimately ended up as a book. But he believes in universalism. In other words, that everybody is going to be redeemed. But I found the book to be quite defensive, argumentative, arrogant, and if I could even say somewhat soulless. It was shocking to me because I would think a universalist would be happy. <laughs> But I found this book to be anything but that. It was quite a fascinating read for me. So as we give consideration to hell this morning, I know it's a controversial matter. I know there are a lot of questions about hell. So here are a few matters to consider as we begin. Here, I think, are the key questions. Number one, is hell a real place? That's the first question. Second, is hell an eternal reality? In other words, there are some who teach annihilation. Hell is real, it's just not eternal. Third, is hell a place of torment and suffering? If hell is a real place, is it actually a place of suffering? This may be the most profound one. Number four, how could a loving God cast people into hell? And that's where the whole theory of universalism um, arises. And then finally, what about people who've never heard about Jesus? Well, you may have even more questions than that. I think these are the major ones, and I'm, I'm not necessar necessarily going to try to tackle them one by one in this message, but I want to walk you through a conversation, and I just want us to explore together this morning what the Bible teaches about hell. Is that okay? Just, I just want to walk us through what it, it appears to me that the Bible teaches about hell We'll spend some time in theological and philosophical reflection over these next few minutes. I would say for some of us, our view of hell just might be more shaped by Dante's Inferno in the Divine Comedy, his nine-stage descent into hell, than it is what the Bible teaches. Um, if you remember, stationed right over the entry to hell, according to Dante, is the sign that says, Abandon hope, all ye who enter. Here's what I'd say about the biblical take on hell. Barely mentioned in the Old Testament. Hell is mentioned 
addressed and acknowledged by Jesus in all four Gospels and by Paul, Peter, James, Jude, and John in their writings in the New Testament. So all of the New Testament authors, for the most part, somehow address hell. Now here's what I would say about it, though. I think we have to remember this whenever we think about hell. These biblical writers and Jesus are seeking to share something with us that is really difficult to understand and it's beyond any of our experience. It's challenging to comprehend, to say the least. <laughs> hell is from another realm. Hell is, is another dimension. And language is limited, particularly when we're trying to grasp something beyond anything that any one of us has ever known. Metaphorical language is employed in the Bible. It's always associated with punishment and torment regarding hell. You can't escape it. When hell is mentioned in the Bible, you find phrases like weeping and gnashing of teeth or lake of fire. Those kinds of metaphorical phrases are used with regards to hell. Now, with that said, I think it's important, though, for you and I to do just a quick vocabulary check whenever we're going to have a conversation about hell. So let me just offer you both the Hebrew and the Greek words that are used in the Old Testament and the New Testament as we have this conversation. So here's a vocabulary. First of all, the word sheol. Sheol is a Hebrew word. It is the Old Testament word for the abode of the dead. It's used some 60 times in the Old Testament. It is limited, though, in its explanation of sheol. It's the dwelling place of the dead. Sometimes you'll find a phrase like this. When someone dies, they are gathered to the fa their fathers in Sheol. That's, that's sometimes the imagery that's deployed in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the New Testament is written in Greek. Greek is a very precise language. And so you have several different words to consider with regard to hell. The first one is Hades. That is the New Testament word for the intermediate dwelling place of the wicked. Hades is mentioned numerous times in the New Testament. You remember when Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus after they both die. The Lazarus, the poor beggar, is in the bosom of Abraham. But the rich man lifts up his eyes in Hades. It is a temporary intermediate place for the wicked. Jesus even mentions in Matthew 16, the gates of Hades will not overwhelm the church. As a matter of fact, when you read Revelation 20, Hades itself is going to actually be destroyed in hell. So it's the temporary dwelling place of the wicked. Then you have this one interesting word, Tartarus. Actually, that's the noun. In the Greek New Testament, the verb is used. It's used one time in the New Testament to refer to hell, 2 Peter 2, 4. And it is a dwelling place for disobedient angels. But the word for hell in the Greek New Testament is the word Gehenna. It's the most common word for hell in the New Testament. It is derived from the Valley of Hinnom, which is just outside of Jerusalem. Now, if you know anything about that geography just outside of Jerusalem, the Valley of Hinnom is where children were sacrificed to the pagan god Molech. So it is a condemned piece of geography in Israel. It became the garbage dump for the Israelis. It was a place where refuse was kept and burned. It was constantly on fire and smoking with this putrid smell. And it became the word that was used to refer to the eternal dwelling place of the wicked. It's used 12 times in the New Testament, 11 times by Jesus. So this is the word that refers to the eternal, the place of eternal judgment for the wicked. That means that as I read the New Testament, hell is empty because we haven't arrived at the final judgment. Hades is the intermediate state of the wicked. Now, with all that said, here's the question that still remains. Even after you look at all that, is hell actually real? I mean, it's, that's still the question on the table. Is it a real place? 
Um, what, what do we believe about it? Is it a place of torment? Why would God, a loving God, send anyone to hell? Well, here's the issue that we have to deal with with regards to hell. As a matter of fact, y'all, I think this is the issue we're just dealing with in general right now. It has to do with authority. What is your ultimate authority? Is it reason or revelation? Those are really the only two options. Is it something that human beings can conjure up themselves or is ultimate truth and authority rooted in what's been revealed to us by God? I don't mean, when I say revelation, I don't mean the book of revelation. I'm talking about the entire revelation of God. How God has chosen to reveal himself. Does that make sense? So which is it? If I'm going to answer the question about hell, if I'm going to answer the question about anything, what is my authority? Is it me? Is it my ability to reason? Or is it revelation? Because for some folks, I get it. Hell just isn't tenable. I mean, if God's a God of love, then how can there be a hell? They just can't imagine it to be true. Here's the problem, though, y'all. And this is, this is where my heart is broken. Here's the truth. The Bible gives consistent testimony to the reality of hell and the one person who talks about hell more than anybody else in the Bible is Jesus. And he's the very one who came to offer us a path to life. So we're left with a choice regarding hell. Do we trust our inclinations, our desires, our sense of what's really going to happen to us when we die? Or do we rely on the authority of the word of God that's been revealed by him through his spirit? Here, here's what I would say about trying to answer that question. Because people, I, I understand it. They want to talk about a God of love. But do you know, the Bible is the only religious text that portrays God as both a loving and just God. There is no other religious text. Hindus do not have a text that portrays a God as both loving and just. The Muslims don't have that. It's only in the Bible. The Bible is the only religious text that presents God as both a God of love and a just God. So for people who claim that a God of love cannot allow hell to exist, here's the core dilemma. The Bible is the only religious text of a major religion that portrays God as a God of love, and it's the same book that portrays God as a just God. So if we accept God to be a loving God, the only book we have that testifies to that effect is the Bible, and the Bible is the very one that reveals that God is a just God who's not going to allow sin to go unpunished. And so there I am left with this Dilemma. So with all that said, how does the Bible present the reality of hell? What does the Bible actually say about hell? Well, let's look at it. Are y'all still with me? Okay, we're gonna, we got just a, a few more minutes. Let me just walk you through what I see in the scripture about hell. The Bible affirms there will be a day of judgment for all humans to render an account of how we've lived in response to his assignment for us to bear his image and reflect his glory in this world. As I read the Bible, the Bible's clear. There's going to be a day of judgment. Let, let me just show you a couple of texts. Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens. And he is on the Areopagus. And he's preaching a sermon to these Athenian scholars. And when Paul gets to the end of this message, um, when you get to verse 29, Paul says, Therefore... We are God's offspring. We shouldn't think of the divine being as like gold, silver, or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In other words, Paul said, I've been all over Athens and I see all these statues and all these pagan gods. He says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people every pair, everywhere to repent. And then verse 31, he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed and he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So Paul says in this sermon, one day there's going to be a day of judgment. And the judgment will take place through Christ. 
Now, Paul will say the very same thing in Romans. Romans chapter 2, verse 12. Paul says, all who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do by nature things required by the law, they are the law for themselves, even though they don't have the law. They show us, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. In other words, Paul is arguing that there's a sense of right and wrong everywhere in all of humanity because people have been created in the image of God. Then he says this, he says that they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience is also bearing witness, their thoughts sometimes accusing them and other times defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. So Paul says there's a day coming when God is going to judge the world through Christ. And then we just read Revelation 20, okay, about the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, you can begin in verse 7. And so, there's going to be a day of judgment. Now, what's going to happen on judgment day? Well, on judgment day, the righteous, the saved, will receive their eternal reward. The wicked, the unsaved, will be cast out into eternal torment. There are several passages that teach that. Matthew 13, verses 40 through 43. Jesus is talking about the parable of the weeds. And he says, on that day of judgment... The unrighteous will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, he's telling the story of the sheep and the goats. And he says, the wicked will be condemned to eternal punishment and the righteous will receive eternal life. Says it in the very same sentence. Eternal punishment and eternal life. Mark 9, verses 42 through 48, hell is a place, Jesus says, where worms that destroy do not die and the fire is never quenched. And then here in Revelation, Chapter 20, the torment is day and night forever and ever. Revelation 21, verse 8, the lake of fire is the second death. So, here's my summary of the teachings of the Bible. Hell is an eternal reality where suffering and torment will exist forever. Hell is reserved for Satan, demons, and those who have rejected God's offer of salvation. Now, as we think about that reality, as we think about hell... How do we describe it? What's it really going to be like? Well, obviously, we're talking about something that's beyond our experience, something really challenging. So I've turned to numerous theologians, writers, to help me as I've thought through this and prayed through my understanding of it. Let let me give you two lengthy quotes. Can I do that? One of them is by Randy Alcorn. He's written a book called Heaven. And in his book on heaven, he begins by asking, is heaven our destination automatically? Is it our default destination? And his answer is no. Heaven is a gift from God. So here's what he says about hell. Hell will be agonizingly dull, small, and insignificant without company, purpose, or accomplishment. It will not have its own stories. It will merely be a footnote in history, a crack in the pavement. As the new universe moves gloriously onward, hell and its occupants will exist in utter inactivity and insignificance, an eternal non-life of regret and perhaps diminishing personhood. Let me read you what Tim Keller says about hell, his book, The Reason for God. He says, in short, hell is simply one's freely chosen identity apart from God on a trajectory into infinity. We see this process writ small, in addictions to drugs, alcohol, gambling, and pornography. First, there's disintegration. Because as time goes on, you need more and more of the addictive substance to get an equal kick, which leads to less and less satisfaction. Second, there's the isolation. As increasingly you blame others and circumstances in order to justify your behavior. No one understands. Everyone's against me. Is muttered in greater and greater self-pity and self-absorption. When we build our lives on anything but God... That thing, though a good thing, becomes an enslaving addiction, something we have to have to be happy. Personal disintegration happens on a broader scale. In eternity, this disintegration goes on forever. There's increasing isolation, denial, delusion, and self-absorption. When you lose all humility, you're out of touch with reality. No one ever asks to leave hell. The very idea of heaven seems to them a sham. In other words, hell... Hell's not really the opposite of heaven. 
hell is just going to be a really sad and lonely eternal existence. Here's what I would say in conclusion. Three things about hell. I believe that hell's existence is an affirmation of the significance of humanity. If I didn't believe in eternity, then I would quit this job and do something else that's really fun. I'm a fun guy. But you know what? I believe in eternity. So consequently, I believe your life on this earth matters. It's of great consequence. Your decisions about Jesus, about God, about the authority of the Bible, actually matter. You're not an animal. You're not a mere animal. You're not just a compilation of molecules and matter that will just cease to exist upon your death. You're a person. You're created by God in his image. And he has designed you for eternity. And your life counts here on earth and in eternity. And without accountability and ultimate judgment, our lives simply amount to nothing. Hell to me actually affirms our significance as human beings. Second, hell's existence is an affirmation of God's perfect justice. You know, everybody believes in justice. Justice is a universal reality and expectation. We actually recoil whenever justice is not served. We all want it. Anytime something unjust happens, we never afford it, refer to that as a good thing. We always say it's bad when people get by with evil things. True? We recoil. And you know, the call for justice spans the political spectrum. There are very few things that unite Democrats and Republicans in America right now. Very few. They agree on very little, but they all share a universal call for justice. Right now, in America, there are many people on the political right who are hoping that Hunter Biden will finally be brought to justice. At the same time, there are many people on the political left who are hoping that former President Trump will finally be brought to justice. In other words, Democrats and Republicans both want justice. Now, they may view it from different perspectives. It's just universal. Do you remember the school shooting in Uvalde? Do you remember how repulsed we were by what appeared to us? Now, I wasn't there, and I'm not a police officer, and I don't want to speak condemningly, but do you remember how America in general wondered, how can you not go in and take out an active shooter who's claiming the lives of innocent children? Are, are y'all with me? You remember this, right? It was like something has to be done. In other words, all Americans, when they see this kind of evil, something has to be done. Someone who is that evil, in our understanding, deserves to be stopped and punished. That universal desire for justice, it finds its greatest fulfillment in the final judgment because God is perfect and he's a God of love and his justice will be perfect. And so I have to trust God to be the perfect judge. And I think the reality of hell affirms the perfect justice of a perfect God. And then finally, I would say hell's existence is an affirmation of God's perfect love. That one might be the one that's most challenging. It might be a tad harder to comprehend. But our God is a God of love, and he's created us with free will. He loves us so much, he even allows us not to love him back. However, the idea that God's love has no boundaries and love simply accepts everyone and everything and every activity and all they do will not pass the test of reality. But God's love is on display through Jesus Christ, and God has offered us a way to him and out of hell. Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved. Here's probably the way I would summarize it for me. If you deny the existence of hell, then in my opinion, in my understanding of the scripture, you minimize the cross of Jesus. And you also, to me, reduce the teachings, the life, the death, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. So it would be my contention that God doesn't actually send anyone to hell. It would be my contention that human beings choose that for themselves. 
So I will close with this quote from the brilliant C.S. Lewis. Here's what he says. There are only two kinds of people. Those who say, thy will be done to God are those to whom God in the end says, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. So again, I would agree with Lewis. Hell is a choice. And those who will be there will be there of their own accord. As sad and as hard as it is for me to say that. Now you'll ask the question, what about those who've never heard? I'll be honest with you. My contention, I have a certain personal conviction about it, but I just don't know for sure the Bible addresses it clearly enough for me to definitively say it to you. I will say this, with everything in my being, I trust God. And in the end, to me, that is the only path. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, today, this, this is a heavy subject, more so for you than us. Because after all, you are the only one who has the full, true, eternal perspective. And so, Lord, we, we confess we're limited in our knowledge and our understanding. But as best we know, this is a very real, real place. And you've given us an answer and a hope and a path so that we don't have to experience it. And so, Lord, I pray that we will give it due consideration and that it will affect us in such a way that we will give ourselves to the task of making sure that others know there's a path that will lead to a different destination. And that is ultimate life with you. So for those, Lord, that are on the broad way right now, I ask God that you would give us wisdom and courage and grace to share the good news of Jesus with them and help them find their way on the narrow way, the Jesus way. May it be so. And we pray in his name. Amen. I invite you